Bienvenue à cette deuxième journée THS, première journée de la partie proprement scientifique, avec cette première session donc sur une série de thèmes absolument primordiaux. Je m'appelle Marc Oriacombe, c'est un privilège pour moi de présider avec Charles O'Brien cette session. Sans perdre plus de temps, euh, nous, nous, la, la session de ce matin est, est divisée en deux parties, avant la pause et après la pause. Avant la pause, nous allons avoir trois communications successivement donc, de euh, Herbert Kleber, Charles O'Brien et Marie-Jeanne Crick. Chaque euh, présentateur euh, va intervenir euh, l'un après l'autre pour une trentaine de minutes et nous prendrons les questions à la fin des trois premières présentations jusqu'à jusqu la pause. Sans plus tarder, le premier présentateur, donc Herbert Kleber, c'est, comme tous les, les présentateurs de ce matin, ce sont des têtes de chapitre dans les manuels de référence de la dictologie. Herbert Lieber est l'auteur de très très nombreuses publications, le, 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 le leader d'une équipe extrêmement diversifiée et qui est maintenant à New York, à Columbia, une université extrêmement prestigieuse. Et son intervention va porter sur une question absolument d'actualité dans le contexte français, sur finalement la durée des traitements, quelles données à notre disposition. Hop. Thank you and my appreciation to the organizers for having invited me and I look forward to my presentation and the rest of the meeting. As you can see the topic opioid maintenance terminable or interminable. When I first gave a talk along these lines they mistranslated it to terminal or interminable. And I said, we're trying not to kill anybody. So uh, it is inter, you know, terminable. Let me start by a quotation from a paper I wrote in 1977, which sort of sets the tone for the talk. Uh, and as you can see, whether individuals successfully maintained on methadone can eventually be withdrawn and lead socially satisfactory and opiate-free lives is a matter still not satisfied and open to vigorous debate. It is, of course, part of a larger issue, namely whether individuals dependent upon any opiate, whether it's heroin or methadone, can remain drug-free and why or why not. And that was 1977, about 10 years or so after the original uh, papers by the Rockefeller Group. Let me begin by just spending a few minutes on some important aspects of U.S. history in this area, which explains how we get to this dilemma. At the beginning of the 20th century, opiate withdrawal in our country was considered adequate for treatment of narcotic addiction. So anyone who relapsed did it from choice, not necessity. Thus, they were moral degenerates. Uh, but so many people relapsed that a number of cities set up narcotic clinics to legally provide heroin or morphine to addicts. But because these were short-acting opiates, uh, they required either multiple visits to the clinics or giving take-home, and there were major concerns if they had take-home about diversion, and therefore they were deemed a failure because of some diversion, but mainly because they did not lead to abstinence, which was still felt to be the key uh, outcome. And so by 1923, all these clinics were closed. But other than the clinics, the Harrison Act in 1914 forbid doctors to maintain active addicts. And over the next 20 years or so, over 25,000 physicians were indicted, and approximately 2,500 went to prison for uh, pre prescribing opiates on a maintenance basis to addicts. 
And that sort of put a, uh, a chill on the whole medical profession, and most doctors wanted nothing to do with treating addicts. And the best definition of what was going on during that time was that treatment was scarce, relapse was common, and prison was frequent. Dr. George Valiant, who was with me at Lexington in the early 60s, did a 20-year follow-up from uh, roughly uh, 1956 to 1976. Uh, I'm sorry, from 1962, uh, the patients were followed for 20 years. And what they found is that uh, over those 20 years, about a quarter, 23%, died mainly of overdose. And about a third were stably abstinent and 25% were known to be using. A couple decades later, the Dutch, Termes Huysen, uh, studied uh, roughly 900 Amsterdam narcotic addicts, followed between 1985 and 2002, uh, who were recruited from a low threshold methadone. And uh, interestingly enough, the figures were practically identical to the study that Valiant had done uh, on patients who were addicted 20 years earlier, about a quarter had died, 27%, and about 27% were abstinent. So very, very similar. Then along in came the mid-60s, and the Rockefeller Group, Dole, Nicewander, and Creek began methadone maintenance. But the federal agencies looked for every excuse possible to uh, shut it. And fortunately, Dr. Dole had taken the precaution of enlisting some of the best law firms in uh, New York to defend the program. And when the feds came to shut him down, he refused to close the program down, and it survived. Uh, in 1968, our program at Yale and the one in Chicago and Philadelphia began. But in Philadelphia, the district attorney threatened to arrest any doctor who was prescribing methadone to addicts. And so for the next four or five years, there was this continual tension until President Nixon announced a war on drugs in 1971. Uh, he was concerned that uh, so many of the soldiers in Vietnam were coming home and had been addicted that this would lead to a crime epidemic. And so he declared a war on drugs. He hired Jerry Jaffe as his first drug czar. And uh, one of the things that was promoted was methadone maintenance as a good way of maintaining his image as a law and order president. And interestingly, as a comparison to now, where roughly two thirds of the federal budget goes for supply reduction, that is mainly law enforcement. Uh, at that time, only one-third went for supply reduction and two-thirds went for demand reduction or treatment and prevention. But the opposition to methadone began very quickly uh, because it was just like at the turn of the century. This was substituting one addiction for another. Uh, Drug-free programs opposed it as likely to reduce concerns about poverty and social ills. Some black leaders, uh, and we saw a lot of this in New Haven, saw it as genocide, uh, claimed we were chilling out the ghetto without doing anything about racism, jobs, housing, and other ills. Yes, they agreed we were reducing crime, but from their point of view, that simply took society's attention away from all of these other social ills. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes that emerged around that time was from the director of one of the first therapeutic communities. He was asked about uh, what he thought of methadone maintenance, and he said, I think methadone is a great idea. We should give money to bank robbers, women to rapists, and methadone to addicts. That was 1966, at the very beginning of methadone maintenance. So uh, that kind of feeling that you're simply pandering to the worst uh, aspects of human beings uh, by giving methadone. Uh, 30 years later, the Institute of Medicine uh, gave a wonderful report in which they said 
current policy puts too much emphasis on protecting society from methadone and not enough on protecting society from the epidemic of violence, addiction, and infections, which methadone can help reduce. And the next quote is a very controversial one because it seems to have been totally ignored by the uh, uh, AA and NA programs. And this was from Bill W., who is the co-founder of AA. And he was a good friend of Vince Stoll. In fact, he arranged for Vince Stoll to be on the Central Council of AA. And uh, in a paper that Dole wrote around 1991, he said that Bill W. told him, I should look in my future research for a medication to relieve the alcoholic's sometimes irresistible craving so that he can enable, enabling him to progress in AA toward social and emotional recovery. So Bill W. was clearly open to the idea that uh, addicts, uh, alcoholics, might need a medication to help get over the habit while still needing the 12 steps to get their lives together. But at many, perhaps most, of the AA and NA meetings, in the US at least, if you get up at these meetings and say you're on methadone or you're on buprenorphine, you'll be told to sit down. Uh, that you are still an addict and uh, until you uh, are getting off these medicines, uh, you should not be speaking at a meeting. In 1990, um, when I was at the Office of National Drug Control Policy, because there was still a lot of bad feelings and prejudice toward methadone, we issued a white paper saying that methadone was both a legitimate and important part of the spectrum of drug abuse treatment, but that did not end the uh, opposition to it, and we still have mayors, governors, other public officials, senators, saying that methadone should either be shut down or limited to no more than six months in a person's lifetime. However, the scientific data suggests that methadone has had many successes. Marked improvement in reducing uh, illicit drug use, uh, especially opioid use, decreasing uh, sickness and death, decreasing crime and the risk of HIV infection, and improving social and vocational functioning. There's a, a little over a quarter of a million individuals in the United States on methanon, and more than a million worldwide. But some countries, such as Russia and Afghanistan, uh, both countries with major opiate problems, forbid the use of methadone or any other opioid to maintain addicts. In terms of doses, here again, programs sometimes uh, maintain people, but they do it at inadequate doses of 40 to 60 milligrams when the data shows that doses above 80 are usually better, and some studies have suggested above 120, although that in, uh, increases the risk of the uh, prolonged QT interval. Uh, this is a study on the effect of methadone maintenance on IV use for 368 male methadone patients in six programs. At the end of the first year, IV use was down to two-thirds, 63%. At the end of the third year in methadone, it was down to about 42%. At the end of the fourth year, down to 28.9%. Crime also sharply dropped. In comparison, in studying 105 dropouts from uh, these methadone programs, 82% had relapsed to IV use uh, within one year of dropping out. Another study on methadone effectiveness versus no opioid replacement. This is a review, a Cochrane review. Uh, 11 studies met the criteria for inclusion. All were randomized clinical trials with 1,969 uh, patients. And the main results that methadone was significantly more effective than non-pharmacologic approaches in retaining patients, suppressing heroin use, and uh, decreasing criminal activity and mortality, although not statistically significant. 
death rates. As you see here in a matched cohort, people maintained on methadone compared to that matched cohort, there's a higher death rate in uh, the methadone group compared to the matched cohort, but nothing compared to the other three groups of the people who left methadone voluntarily. They were almost double the people still on methadone. The people that uh, left involuntarily, they were thrown out of the program, were uh, like six times greater uh, death rate. And those who were untreated at all had almost um, seven times greater death rate. What about getting off methadone and tapering to abstinence? Um, this is a study from a treatment program that uh, both encouraged indefinite maintenance and getting off of methadone if you wanted to by slow tapering. None of the 30 patients completed the methadone taper. Two-thirds stopped uh, the taper and said, I want to go back up. 13% uh, switched to buprenorphine and 10% were discharged because of uh, other factors and 10% continued to taper. So methadone to abstinence did not work for the majority of patients. One question gets raised was the difficulty uh, in withdrawing from methadone due to detoxification methods. methods. Maybe we weren't doing a good enough job in uh, withdrawal. And what you see over uh, the, the last 20 years in the last century, a number of other techniques came along. Uh, at Yale, we developed the uh, clonidine method of uh, detoxification from heroin or methadone. And then we paired clonidine with naltrexone and came up with a rapid detoxification around 1981, 1982. In 1990s, there was this ultra-rapid detox under anesthesia. Uh, we tried that at Columbia. Uh, and we found that it could be positively dangerous. One of our patients almost died. One practitioner in a New Jersey, Philadelphia area lost his license because he had uh, almost a dozen deaths uh, from uh, this uh, ultra-rapid procedure. So um, I do not recommend this procedure. Uh, in the uh, last decade, because of buprenorphine, that's become uh, one of the favored ways of withdrawing people. Uh, and uh, there seemed to be no difference between short-term bup taper and a longer taper on those who had only been on bup for one month. Uh, and especially since the death rate, uh, there was a NIDA uh, conference uh, on this a couple months ago because of papers that have come out showing the high death rate uh, when you first withdraw from these drugs. And uh, one way of getting around that is to uh, put the person on a long-acting version of naltrexone, uh, the one-month depot. What about individuals who don't go on maintenance at all, and they say, look, I don't want maintenance. Uh, I don't care what your statistics are. I just want to withdraw from my heroin or Oxycontin habit. Um, so uh, primarily they do this not so much to get clean, but to lower the cost of their habit, or uh, less often as a pretreatment before they go into a therapeutic community or uh, go on opioid antagonists. And uh, there's a very, very high relapse rate, and it seems to be less a function of the method used and more for why they were seeking detox. If it was only to lower the cost of their habit, not surprisingly, they almost all relapsed. Um, it may also be, and uh, Dr. Creek may be speaking about this, about brain changes developed during dependence. Those who completed detox tended to have a longer time to relapse than a dropout. And so our colleague from uh, UCLA, Walter Ling, who always comes up with wonderful quotes, said that detoxification from heroin is good for many things, but staying off heroin is not one of them. Um, and uh, that's a very accurate uh, and short quote. So why do people relapse when they get off of methadone?
One reason, one reason is because they never achieved rehabilitation. Uh, they may have left the program in good standing, but uh, they didn't really leave because they wanted to, but they were under pressure from family or friends to do so. And during the time they're on a program, they did not have training in uh, job seeking or employability skills. Uh, they did not have a non-using peer group. And while in treatment, uh, usually comorbid psychiatric disorders were not addressed, nor was condition cues or learning how to cope with stress. And we'll see uh, in a few slides that coping with stress is very, very important. And again, a wonderful quote from Vince Dole, the stupidity of thinking that just giving methadone will solve a complicated social problem seems to me beyond comprehension. And yet, uh, many programs do that. Um, here is a slide from Dr. McClellan from the Philadelphia group. Uh, these were 92 male IV opiate users randomly assigned to uh, three interventions uh, when I entered a six-month methadone program. Doses were comparable in all groups. The results, and this is a busy slide, but I'll go over it very quickly, three different groups. One was basically just methadone, uh, methadone alone, MMS, minimum methadone. Second group was methadone plus counseling, which is uh, sort of treatment as usual in most methadone programs. And then the third was enhanced services, methadone plus counseling and medical, psychiatric, employment, and family therapy. The first group, 69%, uh, had to be transferred out of that uh, because of unremitting use of opiates, uh, cocaine, or medical and psychiatric emergencies. Compared to the treatment as usual group, 41% uh, had to be transferred out uh, to more enhanced treatment, and only 19% in the enhanced treatment from uh, this uh, group that D Dr. McClellan and O'Brien had put together um, uh, met the criterion for transfer. Uh, and all the methadone patients that were transferred to treatment to the methadone plus counseling showed significant reductions within four weeks. This explains one reason why uh, there has been a, a decrease in psychosocial services. One company, uh, CRC, uh, this was a, an article about them, and this was a headline of the article, Methadone as a Cash Cow. CRC is minting money with methadone. Uh, this one company owns uh, over 60 for-profit methadone uh, uh, clinics, and it's the country's largest dispenser of the drug. You need to know that in the United States in general, about 60% of all methadone programs are private for-profit. And in California, it's approximately 90% are private for profit. How do you make money running a methadone program? Not by decreasing the dose of methadone, methadone is very cheap, but by decreasing the services. And so uh, addiction psychiatry becomes uh, family physicians who come in uh, four hours a week mainly to write prescriptions. Psychologists become social workers, become uh, counselors with caseloads of 60 very difficult patients. So you make money by decreasing the quality and quantity of services provided. In 1992, there, were pro there was approximately $480 million spent nationally on methadone programs, both um, government money and private for profit. In 2010, it was up to a billion dollars a year on methadone programs. Um, and the average uh, for-profit program charged patients $13 to $25 a day or more uh, for the methadone. Uh, so services were decreased partly because of the switch to, uh, from not-for-profit to for-profit because of the quantity and quality of the staff decreased, and, but also because of cutbacks in state and federal funding. 
because of the points that I made earlier about the prejudice against methadone in many states, um, uh, state funding gets decreased and federal funding gets decreased. Harm reduction, I know, is on the agenda over the next four days. Um, and one of the dilemmas in these maintenance programs is, should patient be discharged if in spite of therapeutic intervention, behavior persists such as continued high levels of opiates and cocaine, uh, frequent missed meds or criminal behavior uh, or violence towards staff or other patients, or should they be kept on, which risks contagion to other patients, negative community attitudes, and forced closure of programs. So if you keep the person on, uh, you uh, decrease individual harm to that patient, but you increase the possibility of harm to the other patients in a program because continued drug use can be contagious as well as other kinds of behavior. When I ran the New Haven program, we had a rule that because of community opposition to the program, that patients were not permitted to loiter in front of the program, uh, and patients who continued to loiter were given a warning, and after the third warning, you were detoxified from methadone. And so one of our patients went to court arguing that the sidewalk was public property. And he had every right to stand on the sidewalk, and we won that case by arguing that indeed he had every right to be uh, on the sidewalk, he just did not have a right to be on the program. And the judge agreed with us so that um, we were able to uh, get rid of the loitering and keep the community from trying to shut down um, the uh, program. So if you take an informal consensus of programs, uh, which seems to be an emerging consensus is that continued use of illicit opiates should not be reason for discharge, but violence or other criminal behavior should. Buprenorphine, high affinity, partial mu agonist and kappa antagonist, available as a sublingual tablet and, and a film strip. Reduced opioid agonist effects with less respiratory depression, a ceiling effect uh, at around 24 to 32 milligrams, uh, but patients need to be in withdrawal to begin. If they're not in withdrawal, uh, and you give them bup, it will precipitate withdrawal if they're currently addicted. Users claim to be more clear-headed than on methadone, um, which may relate to uh, the OPRL receptor, the opiate receptor-like uh, receptor, and ligands. Uh, well, the main ligand is called orphanin because no one has figured out quite all that it does. Um, and Buprenorphine, as far as I know, uh, is the only opioid that binds to that receptor. And there's one form that contains um, naloxone to discourage IV use, and the other is, is pure buprenorphine. Uh, even though it's only been available basically since 2003, there's al already more people maintained on it than on methadone. Uh, over 325,000 maintained and over 40,000 in detox. And there's over 12,000 physicians who are prescribing, at least to some patients. Um, one of the reasons for the increased number as compared to methadone is you can get it from a doctor's office because it's a Schedule three, whereas methadone is a Schedule two. But doctors have to have eight hours of training to get a, an X number. Initially, they were limited to 30 patients. Now, if you have a year of 30 patients, you can apply and get permission for 100 patients. In theory, you're supposed to be giving psychosocial supports or uh, referring for it. Unfortunately, uh, from surveys that have been done, uh, many of the non-psychiatric physicians are neither giving any psychosocial support or referring. And just like with methadone, uh, opposition began quickly. Uh, the for-profit methadone programs try to prevent buprenorphine from being a Schedule three, They tried to get it to be a Schedule two, which would have prevented uh, physicians prescribing it in the office. Um, there was a concern by the DEA about uh, diversion if it was a three. 
uh, and uh, that's come true to some extent. We're seeing increased amounts of buprenorphine diversion. Uh, different than initially, initially the buprenorphine diversion was because uh, there was inadequate doctors prescribing, and so uh, people wanted buprenorphine to help them in withdrawal. Now there's adequate number of physicians, except in uh, some rural areas, but you still see uh, buprenorphine diversion, uh, especially of the monoform, uh, where it can be readily injected. Uh, this is a random assignment to uh, bup buprenorphine uh, versus detox. It was a random controlled trial of cu cumulative retention and treatment. And you see the buprenorphine group, this was uh, from Keiko et al. Uh, in the buprenorphine group, uh, at the end of uh, one year uh, of the 20 original people, there were zero deaths and approximately 15 completed the year on buprenorphine, whereas in a group that was detox and then maintained on placebo, all of them had uh, relapsed after uh, the uh, detox was over and there had been four deaths uh, during uh, that year. So let's quickly end this uh, to give time to the next speakers and talk about why why is this high relapse rate uh, so uh, prevalent? Why is it so difficult to remain drug free? Uh, McClellan uh, argues that uh, there is no reliable cure for drug dependence, uh, that it's a chronic relapsing disorder uh, producing significant and lasting changes in brain chemistry, but is often treated as if it were an acute illness like pneumonia. Whereas he argued that doctors should treat it as if these were type 2 diabetics or hypertensives as chronic relapsing disorders. And then Dr. Creek, in one of her papers, argued that long term maintenance might possibly heal the brain. And we may hear more about that. Uh, what are the theoretical causes? Dolan Nicewander stressed a metabolic deficiency, either pre existing or acquired. Uh, Wickler, in contrast, stressed uh, a conditioning model. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, uh, who is the modern heir to Wickler, showed in his human lab studies that craving and withdrawal are conditioned responses with physiological concomitants and hypothesized that addiction is a learned response, a memory long after drugs are gone from the body, and that even slight withdrawal symptoms or anxiety can be relapse triggers. Uh, 20 years later, in imaging studies, they showed that, that uh, drug-related cues produced a conditioning of the limbic system activation and strong drug craving. Earlier than that, uh, Dr. Martin at Lexington had hypothesized a protracted abstinence syndrome, PAS, uh, induced both in humans and in rats by chronic use of narcotic analgesics. And it's associated with an increased responsivity to stress. And he felt this was a major cause of relapse because of the difficulty of people during the relapse phase, um, I'm sorry, uh, during the drug-free phase to cope with stress. And narcotics are good to cope with stress. They're bad for a lot of other things, but they are good to cope with stress. And uh, he showed at Lexington that these symptoms, which can include uh, psychologic, physiologic symptoms expressed psychologically, such as dysphoria, fatigue, insomnia, and irritability, can take six to nine months to recover. And there's some question as to whether even after nine months it isn't present to some degree. So, Let's end up with what is the reality of terminable. Uh, the reality is even if you want interminable, uh, most patients don't. 50% of methadone patients drop out within the first year in one study, two-thirds in another study. Those that drop out are likely relapse quickly within three months after leaving. 
Uh, and there is a study or so showing that if you reach out to these patients, uh, you can get the, many of them to return. And buprenorphine is no different. About half of the buprenorphine patients drop out by six months. And what we're finding is, and I'm, I'll be interested in hearing whether this is true here in France, uh, whether uh, you're finding that getting off the last two milligrams of buprenorphine can be extraordinarily difficult for some patients. And uh, my hypothesis is that this is due to uh, kappa agonism. Buprenorphine is a kappa antagonist, and as you lower the dose, I hypothesize that you get less and less of the kappa antagonism and a rebound kappa agonism, and some of the effects that you see uh, when people try and get off that last two milligrams seem like kappa agonist symptoms, sort of like uh, abrupt withdrawal of Paxil and certain other antidepressants. You get these uh, PCP almost like symptoms, the brain shocks, et cetera. So what are our options? Uh, you can maintain until socially rehabilitated uh, for one to three years at least, followed by short-term tapering or a six-month taper and then followed by a long-acting narcotic antagonist or indefinite maintenance. And we don't yet know how long that indefinite maintenance should be, um, but the longer, the better, according to the data. Alternatively, long-term agonist maintenance, therapeutic community, or 12-step programs. Unresolved questions, uh, what is the role of the patient's age of onset and the duration of the addiction? How does that relate to terminable versus interminable? Uh, what's the difference between street heroin addicts and prescription opioid abusers, which may have to do both with uh, the drug and maybe more likely with the uh, psychosocial and social class issues, the role of psychiatric and genetic factors, and the role of length of time on maintenance opioids. Uh, so more and more, we're paying attention to the whole re recovery issue. Uh, recovery has been defined as a voluntarily maintained lifestyle characterized by sobriety, personal health, and citizenship. And in a paper by McClellan in 2010, he changed that definition to recovery can be achieved without medication and it can also be achieved with it. And let me close with a quotation from the poets who is always no more than we do, from Virgil, uh, the descent to hell is easy, the gates stand open day and night, but to reclimb the slope and escape to the upper air, this is labor. Thank you.